a long time and hopefully many years to come. And thank you. Beyond that, um, I want to thank Susan for helping and making sure that those of our friends who are hearing impaired are able to understand all that I am saying. And I want to thank the Crown and Anchor. I want to thank the town of Provincetown, which helps us a great deal with this event. Um, our friends at Vans and Leathers. And I also want to give a special shout out to our very dear friend and producer of this event with us, Brad, who's back there, who, without whom none of this could happen. Now, uh, even for a dinosaur like me, it's a little bit intimidating to be on a stage with somebody whose biography is this thick, and it's titled The Legend of Chuck Renslow. And believe me, there are a lot of facts and there are a lot of legends. <laughs> we could talk for days without covering everything that Chuck has accomplished in his 86 year short life that hopefully has many years to go. But uh, we're gonna try and keep it focused. Um, I'm gonna try and keep it on point. If I wander, I apologize, and Chuck, feel free to stop me. <laughs> Have no fear, I'm used to it. <laughs> um, I'm gonna start by asking a very strange but very important question. Chuck, you were born before the Depression started. You grew up during the Depression. You lived through World War II. The Korea era is when you came of age. In that day and age, we weren't gay. We weren't queer. Sometimes you get called a faggot on the street, but the government, the media, your teachers, every institution in the world called us perverts. And that was what we were called by everyone. What was it like to grow up in an era where, I mean, you weren't a closeted gay kid, you were a pervert. Yes, it was. I mean, it, it, it's quite an interesting. Uh, we also were called men many things, uh, she's. Well, that was a, usually a feminine thing was on it. How it was growing up, you had to hide it. There's absolutely no question about it. However, strange as it may seem, when you're out somewhere or anywhere, you could suddenly realize that somebody else was gay too. That term wasn't used. But it's, I think it's just like the same thing today. Eye contact does it. But the rest of the time, you had just about everything you did. Early days. Later on, I, 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 I didn't care anymore. I don't care what they called me, faggot, whatnot. I knew what I was, and I was very satisfied with it. Um, you have many, many firsts in your career. And very early on, as I remember you were in your early 20s, you started photographing young men. When was it? Okay. I was a photographer. I mean, I got that. I went to school for it. And I loved photography, especially scenery. And that. There's no money in taking pictures of scenery. So I started taking pictures of female moods. I opened something, a mail order thing called Century Studios and I was selling female nudes. It wasn't too lucrative, it was okay, but you know, a very friend of mine, same Harlan McMillan, he's passed away now, said, why don't you take pictures of men? You're gay, you'd like them. I said, well, there's no money in pictures of men. He says, you try it. Well, there was money in <laughs> quite a bit. So that's how I started Chris Studio. It was the third thing in photography that I did. The first thing was a portrait studio. And I, I really hated it. You'd get these men and women who are overweight and with jowls on them, and you take the picture and they say, I don't look like that. <laughs> I got mad at one woman so bad. Don't forget, I was in my 20s. <laughs> I told her, I'm not a plastic surgeon, I'm a photographer. <laughs> so when you started taking pictures of men, did you start taking them as nudes, or were they in posing straps? Um, how did you get around all the restrictions of the time? 
okay, we had to take them imposing straps because that's the only way we could sell them and get them through the mail. If you did anything else, the uh, government would get after you. So we had posing straps. However, whenever I could, I did take spuntal nudes, you know, and which I saved and they're still at the archives today. Not all of them because a lot of guys would not do it at the time. Some guys didn't, did, just didn't care. How did you sell these pictures? There were magazines out at the time. I don't know if you read any of them, you couldn't have, but any, they were Tomorrow's Man, uh, all different uh, physique magazines. They were f fronted, you might say, by being uh, teaching how to exercise and all this stuff, weightlifting magazines. They really weren't. They were just gay periodicals that people liked. Chris Studio was very, very successful in that. Not because my photography was better, but it was good, it was the fact that uh, both Dom and I, who was my partner at the time, were gay people, and we were also leather people. It wasn't even used at that time, but we were. So we knew the things of symbolism. For instance, we'd pose, we'd, uh, pose a guy and uh, just standing there with a whip in his hand and wearing boots. <laughs> well, anybody who knew, knew right away. And so that made us very, very successful in the BDSM community which at that time, I must emphasize, was not known. That word was even known at the time. When the 50s were coming to a close, if I remember around 1956, 57, 58, the federal government, the post office in particular, closed and raided a huge number of studios. Most people just folded, for example, some of you may know, uh, if you've been around Full Kit for a while, that my quote-unquote gay dad was John Palatinus, the photographer in New York. And when he was raided, he wrote a, what was in those days, a huge $20,000 check to pay everybody off and just folded and went away. Now, you were the one person who didn't fold your hand and go away. Would you care to tell us what you did and how it all played out? Okay. The post office moved against me, not for the nudes, because I wasn't selling them, but they moved against me for excessive strap delineation. I don't know why they got that. I soaked them in water before I gave them to the model, but uh, anyway. Anyway, they sued us in New York. A attorney for the American Civil Liberties Union um, had the case moved here to Chicago, into Chicago where I was. And now I started to fight it. The problem you have was when you lost at the post office, they would tell the local police what we were doing. So of course the Chicago police raided me. Well, my the attorney from New York City was going to say, well, you should just go out of business and save a lot, which got me angry. <coughs> so I went to court. Uh, we lost in the first court, we appealed it. In the appellate court, <laughs> we were in there and we were talking and the State's attorney says to me, did you take these pornography? I says, no, I wouldn't think of shooting pornography. <laughs> well, anyway, went on and on, and finally the judge says, let me see these pictures. Well, to tell you the truth, the judge was looking at him. He was scowling, frowning, and I thought, oh my God, this guy's gonna throw the book at me. He got done with him. He looked up and said to the state's attorney, the human body is not obscene. I'm ruling against you. State's attorney jumped up and says, I want a continuance. And the judge says, I can't deny that. Nine o'clock tomorrow morning. When I worked in the next morning, the judge looked and says, oh, Lorenzo case dismissed. <laughs> that was it. And that... <laughs> Thank you. That precedent still holds. And it was the start of the very first of our nascent liberties, if you will, and uh, one of many things we owe you for. Another, just a side note to that, one of the things I also did, and I did not do it, but I asked Lynn Womack, a friend of mine who was publishing a, a magazine at the time, I forget the name of it, but the post office went against him too, and I said, look, I fought it, you fight it too. And he was living in Washington here, and so uh, he filed 
a suit and went to the Supreme Court. Now, it was wonderful with the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled that the post office had no right to open anybody's mail or to tell anybody they couldn't mail anything. Only a court could do that, which, of course, all their obscenity things just fell through. So, as Chris Studios was winding down, somebody told me that you decided to go into the bar business. What was your first bar that you opened, and how did that go? Well, let me go back a little bit, if you don't mind, and, and give you some history. Uh, I had, we had, there was about five of us in Chicago who were leather men, you know. Uh, we weren't leather, leather jackets like we see today. I was more like baseball jackets. But anyway, they were jackets, and we had caps. So I said to the guys, let's all go to a bar and sit down on the bar and see if we can attract more people. Well, the first bar we went to a place called Omar's, which was downtown Chicago. It was a cafeteria in the daytime and a gay bar at night. We were there about two weeks, and the manager of the bar says, get out of here. All those uniforms and caps, you're scaring our customers. <laughs> so I didn't give up, so I went to a, a bar in the Lane Hotel. That was pretty good. We were there about six months, and then they said, oh, you got to move. We're turning the hotel down. I guess that was a good reason to move. Then we moved to a place on Broadway. Today it's still there. It's called Friar Tuck. At the time we called it the High Hole. We were there just a little over a year. We got a pretty good crowd, 30 to 40 people on a Friday and Saturday night. Once again, the woman that owned the bar sold the bar. We had to leave. Well, a friend of mine told me about a bar that he was in on Saturday night and he only had three people. Why don't I go there? So I did. It was called the Gold Coast Show Lounge. <laughs> and it was run by an elderly Italian man. Well, we moved the whole crowd over there and it was very good. It was going quite well. Then the guy who owned it says, why don't you run this place? I, I could stay home. <laughs> so I did. Okay, in 1960, Excuse me. In 1960, the band died. His son came to us and says, you want to buy the bar? And we said, sure. <laughs> well, we bought the bar, and that was the start of the Gold Coast Bar with a 42-year run. We dropped the name show, show, show Lounge and just used the Gold Coast, but that was how we started the Gold Coast Bar. First leather bar in the United States. Now, most of you don't know this, but uh, in the very late 70s and early 80s, I went to a place called the University of Chicago. And I may have just barely been able to drink 3-2 beer when I crept into the Gold Coast for the first time. And I remember there being a dress code. How did you manage to enforce that dress code? Well, okay, the first place, once again, homosexuality was a crime, and they could send you to jail for it. Very seldom enforced it, but still it was there. When you walked up to the original Gold Coast, it was a wall, black front, no neons, no lights, no nothing. A door which said in small letters, the Gold Coast, and that was it. When you walked in, there was a guy all in leather sitting on a bar stool with a curtain behind him. He cross-examined you, and if you were okay, your uniform was all right, he let you in. If not, he wouldn't let you in, and that's how we enforced that dress code. In the early ones, later on, it was still the same thing. Uh, later on, when we, did, we weren't so strict with the dress code, because at that time, we had, the Gold Coast had two floors. We were strict on the dress code in the pit or the basement, but not necessarily on the first floor. However, if you're wearing sweaters and perfume, we'd sorry out. <laughs> um, somebody quoted you as saying that you could look at somebody and you could tell whether or not they were a leather man without even seeing how they were dressed. They could be in a Izod shirt and chinos and you could know instantly that they were a leather man. How, how is that? Is it just how they looked or? I don't know. I honestly don't know. It's true, it's happened so many times, you know. 
this is kind of silly, but I think I have to put it to a sixth sense or something, a higher power or whatever. But just to give an example, uh, I was in Paris walking down the street, and I saw this kid, I mean, he was wearing shorts and everything. This is fairly recent. So I stopped him and said, hey, what's your name? And he said, one, two, three, he was a little. Well, he was a bottom. I don't know if he's a little or not. But anyway, I don't know. But I had to have that ability. Talking about the Gold Coast, would you care to reminisce at all about the pit? <laughs> okay. The city of Chicago, people, few people realize it, but they raised the city. So in other words, what was the first floor became the basement. And they raised all these streets. Now underneath there were tunnels over the street where you could go into it. Okay, uh, the Gold Coast had two floors. It went downstairs and that was the pit. And uh, underneath the sidewalk, you could walk in there. I don't know what happened in there. <laughs> <laughs> but I purposely arranged so the bartender couldn't possibly see what was going on. But uh, that was the pit, and there's a hell of a lot of sex going on. It was quite a memorable place, um, I, I, I must admit. And, uh, <laughs> well, as I said, I may have crept in there once or twice. Um, it, was, it was a memorable place. Another place I crept into um, was an establishment you owned called Man's Country. But that wasn't your first bathhouse. My first bathhouse was one on Division Street called uh, Steve's. In a way, I was stupid or naive. The state of Illinois changed the law that made homosexuality legal. In other words, whatever two adults did in private was their own business. So I had the idea of opening up a private club, a bathhouse. Well, it lasted about two months. <laughs> we weren't raided because they knew I was on legal ground. But I never knew the city had so many building inspectors and electricity inspectors and sewer inspectors. Every one of them gave us a bad mark. Of course, we had to close. So after Steve's, what was the next venture into the bathhouse business? Chuck Fleck, who owned the club bath, was one of the owners of the club bath chain, came to me and said, I want to open a bathhouse in Chicago. I thought, well, it's time, maybe we can do it. So together we opened it. Now, I didn't want to take any chances, so I went to the police commissioner. And uh, I said, I want to open a bathhouse. I tell you what it is, it's for gay people to have sex. He said, well, I don't know about that. He says, uh, you go talk to the vice man in that district. Yours is a memo and everything. So when I went to the vice man, I said to him, well, we're going to open a bathhouse, blah, blah, blah. The commissioner said it was all right. <laughs> <laughs> the guy was a little bit stunned, you know, but he said, okay, you go ahead and open it. He said, but I'm going to tell you right now. He said, anybody on the street can walk in there and just take part of it, and I'm going to rip that place part by part. You've got to be a private club. Well, if you don't have any customers, how do you get a private club? <laughs> what I did, I threw a great big party. Anybody could come in, but they were all became members. And that's how we got a private club. But it was really a private club. In those days, you had to be introduced from somebody else that was a member to get in. It, it was rough. But we, once again, we were still, a, we, were still we were legal, but nobody liked us. Well, I might admit that in the late 70s, I remember walking up to the window at Man's Country, and you had to fill out a form, and then wasn't it was it one or two people? Somebody had to sponsor you and somebody had to introduce you? Or what was right, it? One person. It, it, was, it was still being run as a private men's club. Still is. Uh, well, yes, too, somebody had to recommend you, but if you came up there and then you walked out because you refused you, for some strange reason, there's a guy standing out in the front and said, oh, you want to get in? I'll sponsor you. <laughs> <laughs> I might I don't know how he got there, of course. <laughs> So over the years, um, the Man's Country Space has also had some other entertainment establishments, other bars that you've run. Um, I think 
Bistro 2 was in there and the Eagle was in there. Yeah. Well, what happened? Man's Country was a cash cow. It was doing wonderful. We had a section in it was for BDSM and everything. However, AIDS hit. When AIDS hit, the bathhouses were literally out of business. Well, we have a great big dance floor. It was an old lodge, and it was a lodge hall upstairs. I turned that into a dance club called the Bistro 2, and that's what kept me going over the AIDS crisis. Uh, the city of Chicago sent, a, sent in the commissioner of health to close the bathhouse. He came in there. I had taken out the glory holes, I'd taken out the free sex rooms and everything, I'd taken it all out. And uh, he came in there and I explained it to him. And I, well, the long story short was he told me finally, he says, you know, I'd rather have people in here uh, where you could teach them something than out in the bushes where they're spreading something. They never bothered me again. Other cities were closed, New York, San Francisco, all they closed all the bathhouses. But those guys were stupid. They didn't take out the glory holes or nothing. I don't understand it. Well, while we're on the subject of public health, um, I think one of the things that helped you was long before the AIDS crisis, you were involved with the Howard Brown Clinic in Chicago, and didn't you sponsor a VD bus or some? Well, I did a little bit more than that. I started the Howard Brown Clinic. <laughs> I was one of the people that started. I shouldn't say take all the credit because there wasn't. Yes, uh, I hired a bus to go away from bar to bar to test for gonorrhea and syphilis. I had a drag queen that was working at Man's Country and I dressed her up as a nurse. <laughs> and I had her go, I'd go into the bar and say, come on, get out tests on there. And that pleased the health department extremely much. But we also found a lot of cases that those guys would have still had syphilis if we didn't pick it out. So your relationship with Howard Brown, I think, continues. And uh, I know they're still giving away free condoms at Man's Country. And uh, you have always been very dedicated to all of our health issues. And uh, we thank you for that. Well, you know, it's strange it strangely seems, and I know you might think I'm a little crazy on this. I consider my close friends my family, but I also consider the entire gay community, leather or not, as also my family. And it's my duty or my want or desire to take care of them, and I have over the years. Thank you. Speaking of community, um, you have been in the forefront, really, when it comes to recognizing and accepting transgendered people, queer kids, long before it was fashionable, which it has been the last few years. Tell us a little bit about the evolution of acceptance of trans people, particularly at IML. Well, it, it, it's quite simple. When they came to me and said, this person is a transgender, transgender, and I thought, yeah, so what? I said, what does the ID say? And the ID says they're a male. I says, well, then they're a male. I don't give a damn how they got there. It was by birth of the surgeon's scalpel. If their ID says they're a male, they're a male. And that's what we did at IML. However, a side note to that is there was a club, I won't mention the name of it in Chicago, who wouldn't let transgenders in when I heard that. So, I said, well, can I come and dress you at your next meeting? And they said, sure. They didn't know what I was going to talk about. And I said, you don't allow transgenders in. I said, why not? And they say, well, their bodies have been altered by surgery. I said, really? Well, in that case, right now, you better change your bylaws and not have any circumcised man in because his body's been changed. <laughs> they changed their whole stance on it. Admitted uh, drag uh, transgenders. As a sidebar, although most of you may know it, um, there have been a number of transgendered people who have run at IML, and there was actually a Mr. IML who was a transgendered individual, and uh, you've really been in the forefront on that. 
Speaking of IML, tell us a little bit about how did it come to be? I've heard that it, I've heard two stories. I've heard it grew originally from the bodybuilding contests at a gym you owned, and I've heard it grew out of Mr. Gold Coast. Well, <laughs> it's kind of right on both. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had Chris Studio. I wanted models. So I joined and worked with the American Athletic Union, AAU, who was doing all the contests, like Mr. Chicago, Mr. Illinois, and all those things. The guy that ran it was an old-time bodybuilder, and he didn't want anything to do with this physique stuff, which was fortunate for me. So I was running those contests. Then I got the idea, well, they're so successful, I'm going to have a Mr. Gold Coast contest. And I did. Well, that got so successful, and <laughs> we couldn't get in the bar at the time it was doing it. You had lines on the street. So Don, my partner, said to me, well, we, we've got to move somewhere else. And I said, well, we can't move and have a Mr. Gold Coast somewhere else. So he said, no, we can't. So we battered with it, along up and back, and he finally says, call the International Mr. Leather. And I said, that sounds good. And we did. And the first one was at one of the hotels downtown. How big was the first IML? Well, the first IML was 400 and some spectators and I think six contestants. Uh, then, what the, a lot of the thing was, we had a contestant there from Germany even. I took the poster that Dom made and had it translated into German and mailed it to all the German bars in Germany. And I wanted to be international, so that did it. The following year, a gentleman won from um, uh, uh, Sydney, Australia, and uh, that made us really international. And over the years it has grown, how big is IML now? Uh, it's a hard question to answer. When we have the actual contest, we have maybe 3,000 people in it. However, Something between five and six thousand people go through the leather market. So, what, which are you going? How are you going to use it? What are you going to say? And also, a lot of people just come to the hotel because that's so cruisy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a hard thing to manage. You got to take. I gave you the figures. You figure it out yourselves. Um, what is your proudest moment? For I think when the transgender, transgender person won, I was so pleased that he was transgender and in a wheelchair, he couldn't walk, that uh, the people, the audience was so damn liberal. I mean, I almost suspected when they told me ahead of time who won, I thought, oh my God. What's going to happen? What's the audience going to do? Because I've had a lot of heat for even letting them in the contest. Well, when he was announced, the house went up in a roar. Applause, applause, applause. And that made me feel so good. There's a lot of people who uh, have been afraid of you over the years. A lot of rumors and stories. But you told me a story once about your taking a kid home and he got scared. Can you tell us that story? Okay. There was this man, I, mean, I don't like both young boys, but this was man, I think he was, said he was 30, 31 years old. I met him in the Gold Coast. I says, come on, you want to go home with me? And he says, sure. Got in the car. And I, my name is Chuck. And this was whatever, you know. And we got to the front door. And he said, what's your last name? I said, Renslow. You're Chuck Renslow? Got out of the car and ran. <laughs> I will tell you, in the late 70s and early 80s, everybody in Chicago was in awe of you. But there was a little fear mixed in there. Um, but you're an extraordinary man. And one of the other things you've done for us is you've been deeply involved in politics. And I've got a couple questions I want to ask you about that. 
The first one is there was a long period of time when Chicago was ruled by Richard Daly the Elder. And he died in office. He was followed by a man named uh, Michael Bolandic, if I remember right. And he was not a very good mayor. And at the next election, a woman by the name of Jane Byrne won. And that happened to be when I was there. I was a great fan of hers. But somebody told me once that you actually met with Jane Byrne, asked her to issue a non-discrimination ordinance, and that she did. Is that true, and what happened? Yes, it's true, and I'll tell you how it happened. I wanted to get in the gym. First, let me go back and tell you something about the old mayor, Daly. I was a precinct captain, in the precinct getting votes out. And every time there was a precinct thing, he would have a dinner, or like a luncheon, for each precinct. <clears throat> well, every time I was there, I'd walk up to him and say, Chuck Reynolds, okay, you're right, Chicago. <laughs> Finally, one time, he's walking up to him and says, yeah, I know, Chuck Rims, okay, right, Chicago. Okay, about six months before he died, I was standing outside of the uh, meeting room for the, uh, the city, and with one of the aldermen called Cliff Kelly, a black man, who was very pro-gay, and uh, Mayor Daly came out, though Mayor Daly, walked up to me and said, Chuck, your time is coming. And he turned around and walked away. Now we're going to Jane Byrne. <laughs> I wanted to talk, talk to Jane Byrne. Well, as all men, it's awfully hard to get an appointment. I couldn't get an appointment. I kept trying. So I called up her husband, who was a reporter for the Daily News. And I said, Jay, Jay Millen was his name. He said, I want to take you to lunch. He said, why? Who are you? And I told him who I was. He said, why do you want to take me to lunch? That's why I want to get to your wife. <laughs> he laughed and said, who was paying? We went to a restaurant in Chicago, which is right across from City Hall. It's not there anymore. It was called uh, Mayor's Row. And uh, we had lunch. He paid. And after a while, we went across the street and walked right into the mayor's office. And she's, I said to her, Mr. Miss Mayor, I would like to, Mrs. Mayor, I would like to have a meeting with you. And she says, okay, just a minute. And she walked out and she came back. My secretary says, next week on Wednesday, I'm completely open to come then. So I did and I came with one of my reporters. At that time, I owned Gay Life newspaper. And uh, we were talking and in the middle of the conversation, I said to her, would you issue a proclamation forbidding discrimination in city employment for gay people? I was so surprised. She looked at me and says, yes. I did not expect that. I expected a usual political answer. Well, we'll think about that. It's a good idea. And so I said, when? And she said, next month is Gay Pride Week. I'll issue it then. By the way, the Leather Archives has the original proclamation she signed. When you had the Gold Coast, or not the Gold Coast, now I'm getting old. <laughs> when you had uh, Man's Country, and when you had uh, the Bistro 2, a lot of really famous artists actually performed in your bathhouses. Yes. Tell us about a few of them. Well, it, it's hard to say. There were names at a time I, I don't remember. The one I really know for anything else was the village people. They performed there, and there was a wonderful one. Anyway, I took one of them home. I think it was the Indian. <laughs> As I recall, I went for the construction worker. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, politically, you have a Massachusetts connection because you were involved with Ted Kennedy. Now, can you tell us a little bit about Ted Kennedy, and is it true that you rode on Air Force One with him? Uh, I did not ride on Air Force One with him. I was in Air Force One with him. I was running as a delegate for him to the National Democratic Convention. And they said, well, you got to meet uh, uh, Ted Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy. And I said, oh, okay, where? 
And he said, well, he's at the airport now. So I went to the airport, and there was Air Force One, and I got right into it, and there was Ted Kennedy in there. I mean, you talk about luxurious homes. That was a luxurious plane, and I don't mean maybe. It was just beautiful. But uh, interesting thing, I talked to him. He said it was going to run, and I said, well, I have to go home now. And he said, oh, yeah, I want to take you home. I said, okay. So he got me. <laughs> <laughs> so we walk on across the airport, and I wonder, where the heck's he going? We got into a helicopter, and the helicopter took off and went into downtown. He was a terrific man. I mean, it, to me, one of the terrible things that happened was when he died, because I think he could have done so much for our community. Just, it just, I'll tell you how I met him. This is a, I was at, I was a member of the task force on the board of directors, and we were in Washington, we went to a party at the Senate office building, and I found myself standing next to Ted Kennedy. Now, up to this time, he had said nothing about anything gay. And I turned around him and I said, Ted Kennedy, what do you think of the gay people and gay rights? He turned around and gave me a tirade those people are being misaligned. There's talent there. The company and the city doesn't realize that the government does. I mean, I was just amazed. But from that day on, he was my man. <laughs> well, he was always Massachusetts man, and he will always be in our hearts. Um, we're going to open this up for audience questions. Um, before we do, I've got one last question. Over the years, being a leather man has evolved. Um, in, the, in the original days, it was actually an act of rebellion as I understood it as I was a little boy growing up. And it was basically saying, I'm a gay man who's not feminine, I'm a leather man. And there basically were no rules, it was rebellion. Over the years, things have evolved, rules evolved, but now things have changed and you've managed to keep IML up with the times and the sports cure and puppy fetishes and all the things that are going on now. How have you managed to keep everything so open and keep yourself so open? Well, that's kind of a hard question, but I think you've got to be broad-minded on everything. I'll be honest with you, when I go to see the puppies and uh, people all into it, I don't understand it. I don't know why they're doing it, but that's their thing, and they have all the right in the world to do their thing, and I firmly believe that. So now we'd like to open the floor up, and you guys can ask any questions you want. Uh, William has a microphone, and anybody feel free to raise their hand, and you can ask Chuck anything. Is this on? Okay. Uh, well, since you gave me the mic to pass around, I'm going to ask the first question. Um, there's been a lot of mystique, a lot of talk, and uh, even a, an interesting book written <laughs> recently about the old guard. Now, considering you are the old guard, could you um, just talk a little bit about the myth versus the reality of what old guard actually is? Be honest with you, I have no idea. <laughs> I've been old guard, then I've been new guard, then I've been old guard, then I've been new guard. Some of the stories that I hear going around about what the old guard had to do are just ridiculous. You had to earn your, your leathers. You couldn't buy them. It just it was ridiculous. I think a lot of people are just making up stories of what the old guard is. Outside of the uniforms, the style of things we did, there's no difference. We still fuck the same way. <laughs> Hands up, questions? I'm not one of the guys, but I hope you'll let me ask this question. One of my first, uh, I'm a journalist, and one of my first assignments when I worked at WBZ in Boston, in fact, it was my second story, was the Maplethorpe exhibit opening at the ICA and the huge controversy with the National Endowment and all the fuss over those pictures and what's happened since then. And I'd love to hear some perspective because you predate that also. And I'd love to hear your perspective on Mr. Maplethorpe and his work 
and the dust up in that exhibit during that year. Maplethorpe, Maplethorpe was an extremely talented uh, uh, photographer. A lot of people don't realize that they just think of his nudes and everything. In fact, a good friend of mine was photographed by him. But he was also a commercial photographer. I mean, he did things like uh, beer cans and so forth. But he was extremely talented. Very controversial, but he stood his ground on everything. That's about all I could say. I knew him very well. Don't be shy. Who's next? Come on, pick my brain. <laughs> oh, yep. Can you tell us a little bit about the portraits and the paintings at the museum in Chicago? The portraits and the paintings at the museum in Chicago. Can you tell a little bit, maybe about Tom's work? <coughs> well, my lover at the time was a young artist we called him ATM. His real name was Don Laura Judas. Um, I met him on Oak Street <coughs> Beach. He was 16, and I was 20. I asked him, I took him home and drove him home and up and back, so I said, why don't I go with me? And he says, oh, but you're so old. <laughs> but anyway, he was a very talented artist, and uh, the gold he did, painted, oh, here, I'll give you something. The first Gold Coast we had, the well, first one I had, he went in there and he painted some murals on the wall. Now. We lost the lease there, so we had to move out. Well, I wasn't going to leave those murals there. So Tom and I went in one day with kerosene and uh, or paint remover and sponges, and I liberated those posters. After that, he painted everything on press board or plywood or on something that could be moved. And to this day, they're all at the Leather Archives and Museum. All of them represent a leather bar except one, and that represents another bar I had. And that was a, a dance bar, it was called Zolars. It burned up. People said, oh, Zolars. Our, our model at the time was Zolars, it's magic. And then people said, oh, Zolars, it's tragic. We burned. <laughs> I'm actually just curious. I know for myself, I, I have a glove fetish. I am interested in gloves. That's kind of my main focus through most of my leather community experience and everything. Uh, do you have a favorite piece of leather? Is there a story behind a, a piece of leather that you hold sacred to you or something to that effect? Yes, it's the, um, the one I'm wearing right now. This was done by the Stead Works for me in San Francisco. Uh, the guy that owned it was completely working in the studs. He made this jacket, this vest for me, which is the back you can see. And uh, two weeks, he sent it to me. He was going to come <coughs> and visit with me for IML, and he died a week before IML. So it's. It, more ways than one. I, I, I love this list. Thank you. Who's next? Ah. Thank you. So, in your life and even in our lives, you know, it seems like life is always about fighting for struggles and rights. And, you know, early on, gay rights, and then we were fighting AIDS. And then, you know, as that got better, we came back to fighting for gay rights and, and now finally in this past year, achieving national gay marriage. Do you feel like we're getting to the point where we may not be relevant anymore, where we might not have a purpose as, you know, and I, 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 not to say that the fight is over because there's still more things, but are we, are we gaining so much that we're becoming just like everyone else and is there gonna be a purpose for communities and leather communities and, to identify, or are we becoming so mainstream that we're going to be just other people? And, you know, is what we're fighting for going to bring about the end of some of our community? Yes, it's true we're getting recognition and it's wonderful. I don't think we'll ever be liberated. Nobody else is going to wear leather pants and a leather jacket and a cap walking down the street, but we will. There's no question about that. What I think that someday it'll be where you can walk into a bar 
not a gay bar, any bar, and see a nice guy hand sitting there, and you walk up to him and say, hey, I'm gay, you want to go home with me? And he would say, no, I'm straight, but I appreciate the offer. That's what I want to see. And that's almost happened in some countries. I know Marky has a question, so I'm going to hand the microphone to Susan. Yes, I did, and the back of my book is a picture of a portrait of me that he did. Uh, Tom of Finland was a judge at one of the IMS. I met him through Dom, because Dom was the artist ATM, and they both were enamored of each other's work. Dom thought that uh, Tom of Finland was much better than he was. Tom of Finland thought Dom was much better than he was, yes. A very, very wonderful man. Now I have a mic. Um, <laughs> oh my God, we're in trouble. <laughs> um, a lot of folks don't know, Chuck, that the beginning, the very first aspect of anything of a collection that started the archive was basically a whole lot of boxes and crates in your basement. Um, I don't think people here, a lot of people may not know, how did it all start in terms of you and Tony coming up with the idea of creating the archives. How did that happen? Okay, when my lover died, the artist ATM, I inherited all of his artwork. Um, I didn't know what to do with it. I asked the museum, the, uh, the gay thing in San Francisco, if they wanted it, and they said, yeah, if we could sell it, sell some of it. I don't want to sell it, I sell it, I sell it myself. I could probably sell it for a lot of money. Then I asked New York. They said the same thing, that we can sell some of it. <coughs> Excuse me. So then I talked to a friend of mine, Tony DeBlas, because he was a curator of uh, spiders <laughs> at the uh, Field Museum in Chicago. And he said, well, why don't we start a museum? And then you could give all the Dom's work, artwork to it as a part of the permanent exhibit. I said, what a wonderful idea. So with all the Dom's artwork, I also added all of my stuff from the histories of the Gold Coast and everything else. We put it all together and formed the Leather Archives and Museum. At first, it was just a storefront, but that soon filled up. Um, when we needed the, uh, by the building we're in now, we needed $60,000 to buy it. We had about five. So Tony and I, and uh, who was named in Florida, um, <coughs> Chip Bean, not Chip Bean, <laughs> Joseph Bean. <laughs> Joseph Bean, not Chip Bean. Yeah, Joseph Bean. We gave a, a appeal from the stage at International Leather that year, and we raised $58,000 in cash, checks, or promises, and we bought the building we're in now which is, I always say, that museum is a part of the community. Nobody owns it. It is a community thing because the community bought the original building. Chuck, your involvement in politics, back in the day, what, what, was, what did you think about uh, Harvey Milk? What did you think about Harvey Milk? Well, <laughs> the best way to be a martyr is to die, and that's what he did. <laughs> I don't know. I did not know enough about him. Of course, I was very, very glad that he assumed a, a supervisorship in San Francisco. I mean, it was just another step where gay men would be, and I was very short. At the time, I was on the board of directors of the... Uh, the so the the uh, task force, the Gay and Lesbian Task Force, and I was also a delegate to ILGA, which was the International Federation of Gay People in Europe. And uh, 
Yes, I, I didn't have that much, but I was very pleased that a gay person was elected. So I'm Sister I'm a Miracle with the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. And uh, I think one of the things that I love about the sisters is that uh, we have really strong connections and ties and even overlap with sisters who are also Leathermen. Uh, I was wondering what your thoughts were on kind of that partnership that exists between the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence and the Leather community, and kind of what your thoughts were when you met your first sister. Well, it, it was kind of interesting. In, in a way, it was shocking. And she said to me, he said to me, uh, well, would you let me come to IML? I said, why not? You know, I don't care. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that was my first thing, and it was, it was very shocking. But she was, he was so sensitive to the leather community that I thought, wow, this is great. It's just another aspect. You know, you build things communities and whatnot by addition, not subtraction. And that's why I welcome them very much. Obviously, it's been previously stated there's been a lot of progress on gay rights, particularly this past year with the Supreme Court's decision. What do you feel is the next big fight or the next big challenge that our community faces? Do you mean legally or generally in the public? I guess either. Either? Generally. I think when we get universal acceptance, and that's a hard thing. Uh, even to this day, a lot of people think that uh, well, there's nothing lower. You know what's lower than a drag queen? A leather queen. And a lot of people still have that. That's a misconception we have to leave. Which is one of the reasons why I like the Sisters of Indulgence to come in. Because it shows we as leather men are supporting drag queens. Um, I have a question about mental health issues in our community. Do you support mental health being sort of more talked about at IML? Is it being... Well, do you support it being a venue for, for information, a place for people to get information and support? And also, it's a two-part question, like I said, where do you see IML in 50 years? Well, yes, I support health issues all the time. As I said, I was one of the people that started Howard Brown. Um, we have a 12-step program to, at uh, IML at all times. And in fact, it's run by a very good friend of mine. Uh, and. Uh, Mental health is something I think that the community, not just our community, but all communities, should heavily support. More money is given to other things which shouldn't be. I just say it shouldn't be, but I mean, we also have to get mental health. I mean, we got things like Alzheimer's disease and all that. A good friend of mine who was a ballet dancer and a friend of Dom's got Alzheimer's disease. And I went to see him in a nursing home. And it was pathetic, it really was. And I just think, I think mental health should be aid. I'm glad now, and a lot of people don't agree with this, that finally the United States has a form, not perfect yet, of universal health care with the Obama administration. I mean, we're the only civilized country in the world that didn't have it. And I think it's very necessary. I'll agree. <laughs> Obamacare is not perfect, there's a lot of flaws, but for 30 years the Democrats have been trying to get it in and couldn't, and they finally got it in. Yeah, it needs work, but now the Republicans, if you're seeing them, are just talking, oh, well, we got to get rid of that. We're going to buy it out of auction. Do you know they said the same thing for Social Security? And <laughs> look where that is today. Thank you. Anybody got any further questions? Uh, there was a second part to that question, and that was, where do you see IML in 50 years' time? Well, 
I assure you I won't see it in 50 years. I've gone far enough. I'm, oh, I want to go another 15, so I'll reach 100, but that's fine. I don't know. When I look at the evolution of it now, I really don't know. Uh, a friend of mine who is interested in population shifts and everything, he told me that IML would probably own its own hotel in time. And that's where it would all be happening. And it would be... <laughs> But you know, I can see that we spend a lot of money on hotels now. Some want us and some don't. But you know, if it grows the way it is, yeah, we'll have our own hotel and we'll, that'll, be the, that'll be it for, for them. But I don't know, where will it go from there? I don't know. Anyone else? Oh, one more. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you so much for um, being so open at IML. I'm a leatherman, I'm a rubberman, I'm a puppy, and being accepted at IML is wonderful. Uh, this past year, I experienced that being a leatherman and being feminine is okay. So I want to get your uh, take on, uh, especially like Jefferson Tugger this year at IML, how, how, your, uh, how your feelings towards uh, feminine in, uh, as a Leatherman. I don't even understand you. You are what you are. If you're a feminist, you're a feminine. If you're a Leatherman, you're a Leatherman. I don't see any reason why you can't be both. You know, it, 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 it's ridiculous. I mean, uh, some of the nicest bottom men. <laughs> Over the years, some of the nicest bottoms I had were extremely feminine. <laughs> One more. I, I, I know standing might be a little bit of a challenge, but could you explain why all the letters on your belt are in reverse? Only you would bring that up. <laughs> You're welcome. It's not in reverse. It's a mirror image. And if you pull down your pants, I'll show you what a slap will do. It'll put my name on it just right. <laughs> I want to thank you guys all for coming. Um, we have about a half dozen of Chuck's biographies, which he will be glad to autograph for people. Um, we ask for a $25 donation to the archives. Um, the money will go straight to them, but if you want those during the weekend, Chuck will sign the books and we'll put them back here with the archives. And again, I thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful time tonight. We've got quite the horse race and enjoy and let me thank you all too you know as i said earlier we're family stick together